Good evening. Good evening and welcome. I'm Laura Gelfand, I'm head of the Department of Art and Design, and it's my honor to introduce tonight's speaker. But first, I need to thank a few of the many people who have helped make his visit possible, as well as the entire Visiting Artists series of which this lecture is a part. The Communitas series features artists, designers, and scholars whose lives and works promote the values of equality, diversity, and togetherness. The series has been funded by the Marie Eccles Kane Foundation, Russell Family, the Tanner Foundation, the Department of Art and Design, and the differential tuition contributed by every student enrolled in classes in the Kane College of the Arts. The series will run through the current academic year, and it is the department's signature event for USU's Year of the Arts celebration. I also want to thank Todd Hayes, 3D coordinator and ceramics lab tech, who first suggested bringing tonight's speaker to USU, and who has been the primary organizer for his visit. Now, on to the speaker himself, Malcolm Mobutu-Smith. He is currently Associate Professor of Ceramic Art at Indiana University in Bloomington. He studied ceramics at Kansas City Art Institute and Penn State University and Alfred University, where he earned his MFA in ceramics. Malcolm's work has been shown in numerous exhibitions, one-person, two-person, and group shows in the US and abroad. And it is, his artwork is in the permanent collections of many important museums around the world. His work has been published widely in books and journals, including American Ceramics Magazine, Ceramics Art and Perception, and Ceramics Monthly. I am so pleased to have the opportunity to welcome him to USU, and I ask you to help me welcome him to the stage. Hello, thank you. It's wonderful to be here. We were just talking about this region, and I've been uh, lucky enough to have visited this area a number of times. My wife's family is from uh, southern Idaho, and so we've made the journey to these parts many times, but this is the first time I've had the honor of and privilege of visiting the ceramics facility here, and it's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity, fantastic facilities, and a beautiful campus that you guys have, and thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, we're going to take a kind of a whirlwind journey through some of my life, past, and community overlaps that I participate in, and I'm going to sort of venture into some conversation about my concept of how community operates for myself and maybe for how we all might look at it a little differently as we move forward. So I make pots and play with clay, and clay has been central to my career for about 34 years now. Uh, I got really serious about it as a sophomore in high school, uh, the tender age of 14, and haven't really looked back since. But it's not my full identity, but it, it crafts quite a bit of my identity. So ceramics, identity, and communities is the theme here. And communities are vast and many turbulent times happen in them. Um, my vessels sometimes reflect a kind of impossibility of being able to be understood from one point of view. And I think that's sometimes how communities work, because communities have different aspects. Community comes from a communal uh, uh, word root, so uh, everything is about a shared experience in a community. A community evolves around a shared identity. But some of those things are chosen and some of them are not chosen, voluntary or involuntary participation. So my works can be understood in the round, uh, but from no one angle. Um, these are a few and I promise to not have too many words in my slides, but this is a, a slide where I wanted to show some of my nascent beginnings. Uh, the gentleman standing with me in my svelte uh, gymnastics days, I have a few more stones on me now than I did then, is uh, my friend and colleague and uh, illustrious hero in clay, Chris Staley, who is, uh, was my teacher, and he's an alumnus of my high school, actually. Uh, but. We're there at Peters Valley Craft Center, one of the many locations, hot spots around the country where people can specify and spend time in dedicated study during the summer months uh, in various different uh, fields and go deep 
and have that nurturing shared community experience, a selective community. It's sort of a subset of your identity when you are in your other lives, when you go to these, uh, these hot spots, these workshop locations. And then I have these, these sort of buzzwords as a, communities of influence is kind of a conceptual way to think about communities. Uh, communities of transmission, what are the communities that you involve yourself with that allow you to uh, share information? These are sort of nebulous definitions of what community might be. Communities of memberships might be another set of kind of communities where you self-select to be a part of that member group. Uh, I'm a member of the NSICA conference community. I'm a member of an educational community. Uh, but then there's the involuntary ones. You're a member of a family group. You're a member of a certain political demographic. You might be a, a less political, but just the general demographic of your population where you are. But these are still communities. There's a common thread that holds it together. Communities of access is an interesting way to look at it. Um, because of your relative membership to various communities, you have special access and special communication uh, abilities, shared language, shared knowledge, some arcane or specialized jargon. Um, and then there's communities of heritage that you are adopted into, that you also are involuntary. Um, family histories, traditions within your particular medium. Um, and then your peer groups, which are vast and many, uh, form a type of uh, community way of looking at things. And I have these two sort of images to kind of uh, illustrate the ways in which these communities uh, touch each other. So we have these nesting bowls that are actually nesting bowls made by Chris Staley, these beautiful, beautiful things that are very intimately associated with each other and hold each other, but they also hold the ideas within each other. So we keep going and make a couple more sets down to the individual in the middle. Um, I'll just use one example. So there's the, the community of one, which is you as a, uh, myself as an educator, but I live within my community of peers in my area and we have an ideology that keeps us together and commonalities. And then there's my school, which has its ideology. And then there's my bigger university that houses that. And it has a sort of governance. And as we get bigger and bigger, you start to say, well, there's the national identity of higher education within the United States. And that forms a sort of community with a subset of languages and priorities that we all participate in. And then there's the bigger hyper-conceptual meta level of the idea, the community of the idea of higher education or education itself which then governs how we have language and communicate about these things. And then next to that, I have this sort of bubble network and the way that bubbles have these intimate uh, tangential facets in the way they congregate. And communities might operate that way too, where it's not nested, but more tangential. There's a little bit of overlap and a lot that's not overlapping or allows it to bridge out somewhere else. <clears throat> so one of the first communities that we're all part of is our family community. Uh, this is my grandfather and grandmother, and we inherit a lot of uh, agendas and hidden things that we live through or live out or live against because of unchosen desires. Um, I'm uh, the child of and the fruit of the hopes and dreams of the Civil Rights era. My father is a black man, my mother is a white woman, uh, living in Michigan and married in a time when it was deeply politically against the grain for this, this union of a white woman and a black man to be married. And I am the physical manifestation of the hopes and dreams of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and the rest of these folks. Um, I'm named after Malcolm X. We talked about naming a little bit in the workshop this morning. I'm not going to delve deeply into that right now, but the community and the, the sort of agendas and spirit of work that I do in my life is sort of sort of completing an idea that was begun even in my birth. My parents are both have degrees in art and so I've for the beginning of my life been a part of the art identity and art community and that's wonderful and allowed me early access to make that choice without it being a friction against my family group or it was not a rub, it was an easy thing. Maybe I needed more friction but I didn't have friction. I could be that thing. And so that's me at a relatively young age uh, at Peters Valley making some pots and me in high school again. And with that kind of practice, the, the community of practice that comes from identifying with a subset or a group. But your identity is shaped by the kinds of co-location that you have with various communities. I was a, a hip hop performer, I'm a beatboxer, 
I was a break dancer for a while, and all these things can coexist. You can be all these different things at the same time, and these various community awarenesses give you the ability to be a translator, or bilingual, trilingual, polylingual, in many different of these very specialized languages. So I can talk about stuff with my hip hop and graffiti friends, about what I do in the art world, but I can use language that they understand and vice versa. Or I can translate things that way. Um, and part of the unspoken thing is that visual art is a language in itself that communicates without words. And graffiti artists understand my work very, very directly from the physical nature that it has. <clears throat> this is some of my early work, some of my explorations, trying to come to terms with my identity and uh, the commonality of my community of an African American person and Af the African part of the African American thing. So a lot of these vessel forms are playing with and looking at my histories of the history and cultures from Africa and then sort of cementing them into the ceramics community, which is governed a lot by Eastern aesthetics, Asian aesthetics, Chinese. So there's some Chinese profiles here wedded with some uh, attachments and color codes and uh, demonstrative scale stuff that's trying to play with what I see in the wooden sculptures from Africa. <clears throat> Legacies is a community that you're a part of. The legacy of teachers, mentors, uh, people that make you who you are. Um, I just put up this slide of various people that have guided me in the past. Uh, this is a very, very specialized community. Uh, people that are no longer with us, Bob Turner, uh, Daniel Rhodes, Ted Randall, Val Cushing, all on the near side, close to me. My high school teacher also now passed in the middle. And then the wonderful opportunity to have many of these people when they were still all together, actually peer and student together uh, is a really powerful thing and I try to always pay homage to that community when I give these kind of talks. Moreover, that community, that, that ecosystem of of mentors and teachers is robust within the ceramic community. And there are some that are literally your teachers, and then there are some that are ideologically your teachers uh, from afar. But these are all people that I actually got to work with hands-on um, from various institutions. Uh, amazing, amazing folks. So uh, Tim Mather is the man in the blue shirt down on the lower left. He's the guy that I work with now. And communities sometimes have weird full circles or uh, cycles to them. So as a high school student, a young high school student, I would uh, feed myself by looking at old ceramics monthlies, current ceramics monthlies, Craft Horizon magazines and whatnot. And some of them that were in the, the studio were old then when I was looking at them in the mid early 80s. And one of which was a 1970s edition of Ceramics Monthly. And I remember specifically being excited by an image of a pot in one of those things, and it was made by none other than Tim Mather, who is actually my colleague now, and that I am the area head of the ceramics area at Indiana University, uh, essentially over him. He's my, my faculty member. How could that ever have happened? One, it's a testament to how long lived and how wonderful Tim Mather is that he's still active in the educational system and teaching with me. And another is that I had the tenacity to keep going and ended up in this sort of strange loop. So at IU, you become part of another. When you go to institution to institution, they're their, their own cultures and their own communities in themselves. And IU is interesting, and I, I'm still pinching myself today, and it's 16 going on 17 years that I've been teaching there. But uh, when I was asked to come work there, I was like, really? I'm going to be on the faculty with Douglas Hofstadter, the man who wrote this book, Godel Escher Bach, that's sat on my father's library shelf all my young life that was unfathomable to me. It was impenetrable. I wanted to be able to read the ideas that were in it. And it wasn't until much later after I got out of college that I actually was able to conquer that book. But now I've actually am a colleague with the man at IU. That, I'm still pinching myself about that. I sat in and was on the Black Faculty Council with none other than David Baker, a heroically huge figure in the jazz world. And, the once and former leader of the jazz program at IU School of Music, the Jacob School of Music. He recently passed away in 2016. And through his connection, I knew and had a first-hand story, rubbing shoulders with uh, the community of this musical legend, Grammy Award, many-time Grammy Award-winning legend, uh, 
David Baker, and he could tell me stories about this other man here, Rashawn Roland Kirk, who I've long been fascinated with, and it just so happens that he had played his last concert uh, in 1973 at IU's campus before he passed away suddenly. And all those little circumstances I never could have imagined. The communities spin out like clay spins on the wheel, and some of them, like this guy I never got to work with, uh, Kirk Mangus, but they give you uh, a sense of hero worship or strategies to shoot for because this guy can move clay around like a monster. In the course of 10 minutes, he could throw 200 pounds of clay into pots and forms and you realize that you've got a lot farther to go with your own abilities when you're in the space and around the energy that these people have. So he's an influence, but he's part of the character and fabric of the community I call the ceramics community. And I wanna pay homage to him there. And so now we're going to step into some of my influences. And so um, we're going to shift away from talking about communities directly and talk about how my work ended up looking the way it does. Man, I wish I knew how to ride a motorcycle. Somebody want to teach me? Because I need to own that chopper bike. But that chopper bike is special to me because of what it represents as an aesthetic object as much as it is a functional thing, if it is functional indeed, it may be very difficult to ride. Look where your butt sits. I mean, you are down in the business there, right? <laughs> that thing is like a wasp. It's intimidating, it's sexy, and mechanical. It's got all kinds of lines and edges moving in it. And I want my work to kind of evoke some of those attitudes, some of the sculptural sensibilities that you see in contemporary design, in fashion, in graffiti art, in a bike made by somebody in South Carolina that makes and chops metal all day long and isn't thinking about what I'm thinking about, right? There's a, a sketch of a piece of graffiti that I've done. It's an outline for a piece of graffiti and it, you can easily see some commonality in line qualities and movements between that bike and that sketch, but I wasn't looking at the bike when I drew that sketch. And then there's a couple of my pots. Uh, in their sort of exhibition stance, a couple of cloud cups and uh, these backsplashes of color that are reminiscent of graffiti art. But this thing is also interesting to me and feeds me. The way this stump was cut in the downtown area of Portland, Oregon, and the tail of its root exposed, the fact that it's kind of trapped by the cement street there, but also the the subduction of the top where it was cut at two different angles, the, the torn, jagged edge of the, the tree fibers, all that stuff jazzes me up and I am thinking deeply or it's embedded in my thinking as I'm making new vessels. My sources are as disparate as turn of the century, last century, uh, techo ware objects. This beautiful, looks very, very contemporary, but that's a 1920s techo ware vase, this blue thing. It's contemporary in the fact that it's this electric blue. It's contemporary in the fact that it's got this jazzy, exaggerated proportion of these additions at the bottom, this carved thing. It's a very staid object. You know, it's probably only about this big. Uh, gorgeous object though, but it's, it's a mnemonic for me. And then anybody know from the audience who that painting is by? Just shout it out. Art historians in the art? Anybody? Contemporary artist? Frank Stella? Frank Stella? Amazing, amazing, amazing guy. Very physical paintings. Then there's heroes within the ceramic community that just, you just have to drop the mic, so to speak, or walk away crying because you're never gonna be that good. Ron Nagel. Um, being, it's, it's a lot of things going on and it's amazingly abstract and wonderful. Almost as good as this. This is another community that I participate in and have participated in, and uh, when there's a question on IU's campus from the outside about graffiti, I'm the person that the main office calls. Um, I'm going to actually be in a show going that's traveling across the country from Brooklyn called uh, City as Canvas, graffiti from the 70s and 80s to the 90s, and it started in Brooklyn, and uh, it's coming to the Indi Indianapolis Museum of Art, and then it's traveling to a few other cities around the country. But this is kind of the evolution of what's happened with graffiti art. 
And graffiti art is important to me, and you'll hear me talk about it a lot tonight, in that uh, there is uh, a sense of wild improvisational energy that comes from it, from looking at a very, very discrete set of elements. In this case, the alphabet is the playground. In my case, as a ceramic artist, it's vessel forms and the language of archetypal pots. But I'm frenetic when it comes to my tastes. I like all this stuff, from Morandi's painting to Anthony Caro's uh, warrior on a horse with clay and wood and other stuff, to John Chalk up in the corner, Rose Cabot with that beautiful sky blue vessel form that's no bigger than this, but it has an entire galaxy in it. Rebecca Warren's raw clay tiger, you know, I dig it all. And all that goes into some of my work. So this is a, one of my many cloud cups in an ongoing series of things that I call cloud cups because it came from uh, a beginning thought of sort of intersecting a vessel form with a graphic, a graphic flat cloud that I was going to then conflate, blow up into uh, a stylistic cloud shape. That's about as loose or as tight as I want to get with the description of the cloud. It can be anything. Clouds are nebulous and impossible to capture. And I want that sensation to happen with my vessels. So one of my drawings where I'm trying to draw, anticipating some of the impossible to capture energy from those clouds. And then a piece of me standing by an early piece of my graffiti from way back in the day. Showing another sense of what I want to happen in my work, which is a sort of weird friction between the 2D and 3D, or the illusion of three dimensions, or the physical fact that graffiti occupies this two-dimensional space, but it always seems to compete and never wants to stay fixed visually on the wall. It seems to want to pop forward or dig in. My work has always been influenced by the attitudes, postures, and energy of the whole hip-hop community and movement, which privileges originality and off-the-cuff abilities to make decisions. So when you go into a cipher and you're going to rap battle against somebody or beatbox against somebody, it's, you're being awarded by your ability to invent in the moment. Uh, either invent a rhyme that's cutting against another individual or come up with a beat that's in the moment sharper than the person that you're battling. When it comes to break dancing, you are improvising on the floor with moves that you've practiced but you've never put them together in that routine before. Maybe you're going to do something you haven't done before. And so I want vessels to have some of that energy too. Sometimes literally I try to translate what's going on two-dimensionally on the wall into something physical. Such as these attempts. And I won't read this to you, I'll let you read it. I don't, I, I have a pet peeve about people putting images on the wall and then reading the words again, so. Uh, one of my other heroes from the graffiti community is Rom Romelzi, and uh, he, for the most, the last two decades of his life was not in human guise. He, no one saw him other than one of his many, many alter egos. And he built these costumes and suits that he would occupy. And he wrote and talked as if he was from another planet, another time. He was completely submerged in this, to the point that when he did pass away in 2010, uh, his real name was not used on the thing. His wife would not reveal any of his identity or his date of birth or anything. He said he was 3,000 years old and that he was from somewhere else. Um, and that's amazing. I was going to bring him to IU as a visiting artist for our patent lecture series, but uh, he passed away suddenly at the tender age of 52. Um, he was a mover and a shaker from the very beginning. And so through these communities, you have links. You know, once you become a member of a community, you also adopt the histories of that community and the tradition of that community. So through my knowledge base of graffiti art, I know and have to know and are challenged to know all of its history, all its DNA that goes from here to there. And so Ramelzi was one of the first people that was a, a, a DJ back in 1972 with Cool Herc and a lot of the first people that spun records. And being able to actually physically touch and be a participant in that community is amazing. And then graft some of that knowledge and some of that specialized uh, history into my own teaching and practice and use it as a way to energize students that have no vector for graffiti art. Another thing that uh, governs some of the vectors I bring into the classroom is the community of the collector. 
I'm not only a pack rat, but I'm a collector, a very specific kind of collector. Uh, I collect all things comic books, lunch boxes, pop culture, toys, namely the Hulk. I look like the Hulk a little bit. Hulk is my main man. There's a little animation for you. And yes, that's Hulk 1. If anybody in the crowd knows what they're looking at, that's the Incredible Hulk number 1 and 2. But my, the real, my real love for comics is pretty deep and pretty expensive, unfortunately. My wife allows me to keep going. But um, Golden Age Comics started in 1938 with the Superman Action Comics number 1. And uh, it made news a couple years ago. Anybody know what it sold for at auction, at Heritage Auctions? Give me a number. 100, wow, that's, you're overreaching a little. <laughs> overreaching a little. $3.2 million for a book that was 10 cents in 1938. Uh, the first $10 million comic book will probably sell in the next couple of years, and it'll be Action One. Um, but more rare than that are dozens and dozens and dozens of other titles that you've never heard of with characters you've never heard of that existed from 38 to like 49. And those are the ones I'm into, esoteric golden age comics. Um, but not just because they're cool things and they're old and whatever, but it's the graphic structure, the conventions that were uh, invented in that period, the sort of graphic design conventions that said, we're going to sell this thing. And they were selling in droves back then. We're talking print runs now of a popular title like X-Men or Spider-Man sell maybe 100,000 copies a month. Maybe. Maybe. These books in 1940, like Superman 1 and all these kind of things, a million, million and a half print runs. And now they're almost impossible to find. That's part of why they have their value. Uh, this one's unusual because, uh, and this will come up later in some of my source material, in that we have a, an African-American character. He's a bad guy or a henchman to the bad guys, the green dude. But the, the guy with the skin tone is the henchman of the bad guy. But what's unusual about this from 1940 is that he's not drawn stereotypically. Uh, he's not drawn in some kind of cartoonish way that's lampooning people of color. He's drawn just as virally, maybe even more virile than our superhero, Steel Sterling. Everybody was trying to do the copycat of Superman back then. Every single other publisher wanted to capitalize on Superman. So that's why I have this book. And I'm also interested, this is when all these fonts were being invented. And interestingly, my circles of communities overlap because early graffiti artists in the 60s and 70s went to comic books as source material resources to come up with new ways to invent and make their letters different than the, the guy around the street. So went from bubble letters to letters with stars inside to letters that had 3Ds. They went to comic books as sources for where interesting texts and fonts were coming from. Other sources of inspiration is my own family again. So I've got two brothers, both younger, who do things that I live through vicariously so I don't have to do them. I don't have to kill myself like my brother Jason, who's a, an extreme sports freak. And my brother Alex is an amazing jazz bass player who lives in New York City. So I get to participate in those things from afar, but they're part of my community. As an educator and artist, I feel privileged and honored to be, a, but responsible to be a participant in the community. And so I try to do exhibitions that get people involved. And I did a show in, near, in uh, Indianapolis called Inner City Inspiration. And uh, I proposed that there be an actual graffiti wall that I would have some graffiti artists do. And I had the community work on it as well. We had a sort of a public demonstration of the work and then we installed that in the gallery behind my work, which was sort of a mini retrospective. Um, and then this is one of my pieces where it's actually populated with some of my graffiti art and then I left the work out in my studio uh, when I was building it and let students and people that, and anybody that entered the studio draw or write on it. So it, it was a, sort of a, a virtual wall. And so here I am engaging with somebody, asking questions about what I was doing. We got all kinds of people involved, young kids. We had a, the, one of the high schools come by and work on the wall that we did. And some of the energies, you can see that yellow 
uh, cloud, uh, uh, or a wispy shape that's being partially filled in in the upper corner over there. Uh, there are lots of graphic forms, flat drawn things that are inspirations for where I make my clay work. And so when my cloud cup fascination began, which this is the actual first cloud cup, I did this in uh, 2004, um, it has a lot, it's simple, it's basic, it's clear, but it's basically this intersection between a volume and a graphic cloud shape. Very uh, East Asian inspired shapes, curly cues folding in on themselves and then some uh, slip. But very quickly I wanted to sort of spread my wings about what I was sourcing. So some of these patterns are coming from African textiles, the blue, the blue motifs on this piece, but I've always been interested in the relationship between the tone and surface of raw clay and glaze as a friction to create and push that uh, same push and pull that I was talking about with graffiti on the wall. I want things to flex back and forth against each other. I've been very literal about putting graph on pots before and I've been more oblique about it. I'm just going to clip through a bunch of images of various strategies for blending the two things. We'll be doing a little bit of this tomorrow where I'll be building hand-built additions to thrown objects. So a lot of the objects that I make all start on the potter's wheel and then get distorted and moved around while the clay is still soft. Uh, trying to take on some of the energy and impulse of the moment of the wet clay as it hardens and becomes a stone through the process of firing. Another interesting exhibition I had at a museum uh, was talking more about improvisation as my um, theme in my work and had another group of works there. That, that little snippet there says it all. In the interview that they did for the, the text block of this thing, they, Talked about, I talked about the vessel being my wall, and I want that to be more and more true. Uh, the piece that is the sort of powder dusty blue thing is actually a 3D printed object that I designed in Rhino and printed with one of our 3D color printers. So that's a JPEG image of some graffiti projected on and printed at the same time as the object, which is a pretty amazing thing. Uh, and then there's another version of uh, one of my vessels that has imagery competing with the form. Graffiti is an amazing thing. It's about precision. Uh, it's about speed. It's about the body movement. So these two shots here with the blue piece is one shot from about, I don't know, nine feet away from the wall, 10 feet away from the wall. And the other one shot from about nine inches away from the wall. And that's just a spray can and can skills or hand skills, as we might call it. If you're a calligrapher, you're talking about dexterity and control. If you're a graph artist, it's about using a spray can to cut an absolutely clean line with technique. Um, this was not done by my mentor in, in graffiti by the name of East, East the Beast from Chicago, and uh, his, his ability to control spray paint is epic. Hopefully I give myself opportunities in my work where I can indulge these moments of small sophistication or hand skills. Drawing is something I have to do that's almost uh, an addiction. If I have a piece of paper and a pencil with me, I will be moving my hand on it. If I'm talking to you about an idea of we're sitting at lunch or something, I'm moving it. If I've got a napkin and a pen or pencil, I'm drawing on it and I'm typically trying to move through space when I'm drawing. I'm trying to insinuate layers and layers and overlaps that eventually work into the objects that I make, um, not always directly. I don't look at a particular drawing to make a thing, but it's all part of the DNA that made up this object. Recently, I've been using and doing some research and actually having shows where it's all about drawing. So I had a drawing show a couple years ago uh, during Inseca conference in Kansas City, and I had a show, a drawing show uh, in printmaking. I'm doing some printmaking and drawing right now where I'm just valuing the flat work, which I've, for some reason, let be a back burner thing or a hidden thing in my practice for all these 30 years, some years, and I'm gonna bring it to the foreground more and more. 
And I'm just showing you these as different ways that drawing exhibits itself in the final product of what I make and the variations that that might entail. So I had another project that I had an opportunity to do where that really amplified that 2D, 3D hopscotch quality. Uh, got a commission to, to make a destination artwork for the newly built Eskenazi Health Hospital in Indianapolis, a billion dollar LEED certified building with a garden on top and the ideology is that wellness and healing only happens in the presence of stuff that makes wellness happen. So art is a part of the system of the, of the healing practice. So all the patient rooms have real artwork in them, not uh, factory made prints or anything, real art. There's a, you walk into the downstairs lobby and you might as well be walking into a museum. There's huge, gigantic sculptures craning their way through the main lobby. Uh, on every single clinic floor wing, and mine's on the third floor clinic wing, is a major work of art. Um, so I bit off a lot. I said I could do this, and then I had to go produce it. And I'd never made large-scale ceramic tiles before, but I said I was going to do it. It had to fit ADA standards. I couldn't be more than four inches off the wall, all this crazy kind of stuff that I ran into doing a public commission like this. The paperwork is like this tall. It's a whole different community. Just, be, just in order to be on a site, I'm going to click through this, to paint these two motifs on the physical wall, I had to get a million dollar insurance rider to step foot on the premises. I had to buy a hard hat and vest and all the kinds of stuff. It was, I don't think I'll do it again. I don't want to be part of that community. The public work, you know, there's artists that do public work and they, they get it all down, they have a system, but when you step into it just ad hoc, it's very difficult to navigate. But the final product was quite fun and came off pretty well. And I played with this sort of weird relationship between, I called the work cloud busting, in the sense that you lay on your back summer day and you're looking up at the clouds and you turn the clouds into things, but they're, they're nothing. You get to invent what they are. And so I let these sort of roaming shapes uh, have a disconnected relationship to each other. And they are nothing. I tried to make them kind of open sets and you can sort of imagine what you want. But it was, it was difficult. I put these other images in here to show you all that went into trying to sort of prep them and make them installation ready because it was all on me legally. If they fall off the wall, it's on me. I was very, very, very uh, worried about how I was going to get them to hang. Um, <clears throat> other ways that I've stepped into community. So you have your communities of membership, you have your communities of identity. I'm an African-American man. Uh, Obama's rise to the presidency in 08 was both a blessing and a curse. Uh, and I made a body of work that was the first time I had literally stepped into that uh, arena that directly dealt with my uh, apprehensions and anxieties over my own identity that I live with day in, day out. And so I made these somewhat sarcastic objects that are playing with uh, imagery that is sort of encoded in modern art, the, the Broncuzis of the world, the people that lifted from the African cultures to make their paintings and their sculptures. And then the other side is taking literally stereotypical drawing images from pop media, namely comic books again, and I lifted wholesale images of how Africans and African Americans are represented in comics for children to buy, purchase, and laugh at, and that formed the other side of the object. And so it's two ways that looking at these outside cultures, but yet, I'm, ironically, I'm making it, so. And I did that in a number of ways, used a number of source materials. This is literally an image lifted from, redrawn by myself, but lifted from the cover of Judge Magazine, which was a, a popular magazine like Vanity Fair from 19, the 1920s and 30s. And this is another comic book character who had the name Whitewash, which was supposed to be a ha-ha, very funny kind of moment. And we're working on something like this in the studio uh, right now, it's going to have some more work done on it tomorrow, but I'm not using a racial stereotype figure. I'm using this guy. And this is a very special 
community that I'm involved with, which is the community of my family and my mother specifically. Uh, she knew she was having a child of color, <clears throat> and so she designed and created a coloring book that would reflect who her children would be. And uh, little Tuffy was born in 1971. He is me and my brother, sort of an amalgamation. It was published by Johnson Publishing Company, who publishes Jet Magazine and Ebony Magazine and Essence Magazine uh, under their imprint, Ebony Jr. It's no longer in print, but for about 20, 25 years it was in print. Uh, Little Tuffy is a, a power sign. It came out of the 60s, 70s uh, black power movement, and he's a positive image of an African-American character. Uh, we are going to take him even further now. Since he's, he's no longer owned by Johnson Publishing Company and my mother owns the rights, we're going to do Tuffy for the 2000s. And so I'll be working and drawing some of those things. But I use him quite liberally, and I will use him more in my own work to sort of pay homage to my African-American community and my African-American identity. Our circles of influence and communities overlap in weird ways. So this gentleman is a famous artist by the name of Glenn Ligon. And the drawing that is the cover of his monograph, Some Changes, is my mother's drawing. And the drawing behind him is his version of it, which is him taking my mother's coloring books to the Walker Art Center and having children draw on them, and then he turned them into giant serigraph prints. Um, he's in a, his work is about appropriation, so that's what he does. It's, it's cool. But it's interesting that it overlaps, that he ended up bumping into what he considered to be an obscure, which it is, an obscure coloring book, uh, and uses the images from it and has it reinterpreted by young people, saying that race is not something that uh, we come in with. They don't care about that. They ignore it. Uh, when you see Malcolm X painted in these various ways, there's versions of him painted all different kinds of ways in his prints. There's Malcolm X and Isaac Hayes. Both of these illustrations come from Little Tuffy and his ABCs, the coloring book that my mother made. So I put Tuffy on one of my pieces. It's not that good, this is the early one. But now I'm making Tuffy in the round. So I'm gonna be making these sculptures of Little Tuffy doing various things. So I had to start out with the iconic pose, but I'm gonna do Tuffy in all different kinds of situations, good and bad. This is that finished pot that I showed you at the beginning of the slideshow. So we've got how the tonality and the, the skin tone of the clay is important to me. And then also I just want to show it to you because it's another, I consider this drawing. When I'm bending and moving clay around, making edges and protrusions. Uh, this came out of my the fold series. I was looking at fabric and drapery. I like those edges. So I draw those edges. This is a drawing on handmade paper. I really dig drawing. I can't make up my mind though. You know, I vacillate back and forth. I'm excited by the edge that is created by the flowing glaze as a drawing line, but I didn't draw that line. I set up the circumstances for it. There is a figure there. Sometimes the pot itself is a metaphor for the figure. Other times you put the figure on it. Again, this is from the Fold series, looking at bent and folded lines and edges and drapery and gravity, anti-gravity. Just to get you into my mental headspace that can make things like this. My son thinks this looks like a frog. Now that I've said that, all you're going to see is a frog. But I, I don't really settle into one strategy for how I represent these, this need to play with edges and lines. Sometimes I'll use a plane, I'll add a plane to the outside that will be a physical line or a plane itself. Uh, other times the plane exists on the surface of the pot. 
but I can't stop. I mean, these are all just random backs of meeting agendas for faculty meetings, because, you know, in a faculty meeting, this is what you need to be doing. There are a few notes there, so I was taking notes. This is the first drawing that I had in a commercial gallery, uh, the Louise Ross Gallery in New York City, and I've associated it with this vessel form because both the color and the uh, kind of shapes, it's pretty clear what's going on. Here's another 3D printed object that I'm quite partial to. Uh, I've had the pleasure of, the, the 3D printing is a cool marriage of all these things that I like. So you're in the null space of a software program and you're drawing things that have dimension. Imagine dimension, but you're limited by line. You're using line and graphic form. You're using elevation studies, top view, side view, three quarter view. And you're having to rotate things in your mind in order to craft an object, which is, in my mind, the perfect marriage of this two and 3D hopscotch that I like to do. These are more that are literally playing with uh, graffiti as its playground. So everybody in graffiti has their own arrow that they use that populates their letter forms. And so I have the arrow on both sides of that appendage in two different ways. And I'm making arrows in the studio, which so should be fun. It's another sort of ad hoc association. I didn't draw this drawing to be with this pot. But I just took the opportunity in the slideshow to put them together to see what happens. I haven't come to terms yet with that thing that you get with drawing, which is the null space of the page. So what is the white space? Is it physical or not physical? And the drawing can imply that it's nested in a dimension, but there's no dimension. So how do you do that with ceramics or clay or sculpture, which is physically it has to be? You can make a matrix of mud that the thing evolves from, and that matrix might be unformed, but then it still has to stop and be something. So this is something that still teases me. Like, how do I, how do I make a thing that values that empty space? And then as a researcher and someone that's interested in teaching and inspiring students, I often try to share the things that get me excited and I get bouncy and jump up and down, so they jump up and down. And the things that get me excited are people and things that go deep, where hand skills and the fetishistic need for tools and touch and very, very specialized material knowledge. So if you're a cobbler and you make shoes, you know things about making a last and wood and how wood works and how nails and how leather operates and how it shrinks and how it stretches. And it's the same kind of specialized knowledge that we encode and engender in our students to know about all the different medias that we have, be it metals or ceramics or printmaking or whatnot. You learn the behaviors of paper if you're a printmaker, you learn the behaviors of clay and glaze if you're a ceramic artist. Well, there's lots and lots of other people that go very deep into their areas, so deep that they become amplified examples. Uh, I'll just talk about one of these up here and that's the watchmakers, horology. I might quit my job actually and go back and become a horologist, but I don't think I have enough time left to learn the skills that it takes to do it. That's uh, Roger Smith up there with the little uh, spectacle uh, loop eyepiece. And uh, he is one of the only people on the planet that occupies as an in individual all of the trade skills necessary to make a watch from scratch. The guild trades, there are 40 guild trades, I'm not gonna name them all. He knows and is an expert at 36 of these guild trades. That means that he can make the machine that cuts the parts that do the work, that tools the pieces that cut tiny little microscopic screws. He does all of it. And so he makes an entire watch from the ground up, a thousand parts in the space of a wristwatch. And that fact alone is awe-inspiring. There's more science. There seems, it seems like it's more important and more heroic to have a watch like this on your arm that keeps time precisely than it is for us to have made a rocket that goes to the moon. Um, the watch hands on this, and I show my students a video, one of 10 sequences of a video where he's just doing the finishing work, which takes two days, the finishing work on the hands for one of his watches. And that to me is profound because I tell my students, you know, you have a choice of how deep you want to go. You have a choice about when you want to say what's enough commitment because it's all your choice. You're making the rules for your work. 
There are no rules that govern what your artwork should and shouldn't have in it. So you get to say how far you want to go with it. And you can go this far. You can. So my recent work is playing with some other kinds of anatomies of vessel forms, making vases and pushing them around, making them body-like, playing with materials, firing them on their sides, painting on them, and playing with lots of color. So that's it in a nutshell. And thank you very much for having me. Yep. I'll take any questions. You can stand up, shout it loud, sit down, loud, shout it loud. I'll wait until you speak. Yes, sir. So, a lot of the work you said will take a lot of very different meanings. How did you find, uh, initially, when you were doing all these things, how did you find how to vary the most of the work Well, the main two mediums that I use right now is drawing and ceramics, but there's not a lot of mixed media. I do vacillate, like I, the 3D printing stuff, I don't care that it's not clay. Those objects are made out of powdered gypsum. There is a means of making similar things with the same kind of technology and it'd be a clay object, but that wasn't my interest in venturing into that space. And I don't feel any particular duty to work just in one media, I feel a duty to find a way to express some of the energy I have in that space. Uh, but I'm pretty narrow when it comes down to it. Most of my work is ceramic or ceramic and glaze, but I'm venturing out and having more and more, I'm letting my two-dimensional work have a life too. But I don't do sculpture. I don't bang metal around yet. Um, I have ideas to conflate some of these things to you know, big public work size uh, sculptures, but I haven't done it. Over here. Um, are any of the clouds that you were functional? Well, in a sense they are. They have a cavity. I've made some that deny having a cavity. I've closed off the top and made it another uh, sculpture phenomena. But you could technically use it as a scoop. You could put it to your mouth and drink out of it. But that's not how they were designed. Um, I've thought about changing the name from cup to scoop or ladle. And I might do that, but it still sort of implies a kind of functional ancestry. Yes, ma'am. I don't know. That's the only way I can be. Um, I'm always, I've been. My MO is to be hungry. One of my recommenders a long time ago wrote a, a recommendation letter for me getting a job, and the people, when I got the job, actually in confidence shared the letter with you. You don't usually get to see your recommender's letters, but it, one of the things in, he was saying was that this guy is always hungry. And I don't know where I got that from. I crave more information, I take it in. Like, I know a lot about horology because I'm really interested in it. And then it's natural for me to try to then take something I've learned or a lesson I've gleaned from it and try to marry that with how can that improve how I instruct someone or how I communicate to somebody else about something. Uh, much to my parents' chagrin when I was in high school, I knew back and forth the Overstreet comic book price guide more than I knew anything I was learning in school. You know, I could point to the page column side of what what publisher made what comic book in what year when I was 14 years old, but I couldn't tell you, I couldn't recite the soliloquy from Shakespeare that I was supposed to have done for homework. But in, in my adult time period now, I, I value all that stuff. I go back, you know, Shakespeare's interesting, poetry's interesting. Uh, I want to go deep into all these different areas. And I don't think that there's a real limit of how deep you can go. You can absorb a lot of stuff. I think each and every one of us has the capacity to absorb as much as we tell ourselves we want to. And then synthesize it. We'll synthesize it because it's in us. We have no choice. 
in the middle. Um, so earlier you said that because of your appearance and your heritage, you were born into an art identity. Yes. The effects on myself? Well, I feel like I'm an advocate for creativity on a very basic level for all people. And I think that the creative life, I think, and this is a pretty extreme attitude that I have, I keep it to myself most of the time, but now I'm going to share. <laughs> um, I kind of think that you're somewhat incomplete if you don't figure out in your life that you need to do something of the self for the self and by the self. And by that I mean something that you know came out of you, an urgency that was self-implied, that you recognize in doing it that you did it, like you're watching yourself manifest a thing of, for, and by. And then the for, that the first outcome of the production of that thing is for you, it nourishes you first. The cycle is complete there. And that thing I'm talking about is art. Now, whether that's dance, music, poetry, creative writing, playing the flute, whatever it is, the reason that you step into it, the reason that you worry about even doing the hard work of the practice of it is that it nourishes you, of you, for you, by you. It's this ever recursive feeding loop. And if you don't have time in your life, if you, don't, if you can't give space in your life to feed that organic need that's in each of, I believe is in each of us. We have the capacity to do this. We're creative entities on the earth. If you don't have the capacity, either because of economic reasons, the time isn't there, uh, you have never been given permission, you know, someone that could give you permission. Ultimately, the permission comes from yourself, but at some point in your life, someone gives you the permission it's okay to care about that or go there. Until you get that, I think you're somewhat incomplete. You're not fulfilling your full potential. And that's my extreme view. So take that with a big grain of salt, please. Oh, back here. I wanted to be a mathematician for a while, and I still love math, and that's why I like that Godel Escher Bach book by Douglas Hofstadter. Uh, it married, it's actually a marriage of all those interests, you know, logic, um, mathematics, art, music, it's all woven together, but I, I've always been a bit of an anomaly. My, my colleagues, Chris Boger and Tim Mather, think I'm strange. I, I've always been motivated and serious about once I identified as a thing, I didn't let go of it that way. And I, I think that it was a little fluid between three and 12. <laughs> but after that, I, like, I've been like straight on that way. I'm not saying that's for everyone or that that's natural, um, but that's me. And un maybe fortunately or unfortunately, my son my only child, son, is uh, living with a dad who gets that intense about everything, you know. When we watch the Powerpuff Girls together, I'm talking about the gorgeousness of that hyper-thick black line around the outside of those characters, or the stylization of the thing, or we're watching Samurai Jack and I'm talking about how crazily inventive the compositions of every single second of that thing is, and, and it's all valuable to me. Um, I hope I'm not creating a strange, you know, bizarre child that is insecure. Over here. Well, my teaching philosophy, I think, is mostly shaped by the inheritance of the kinds of values that my teachers had for what it meant to be a ceramic artist or, or in both, and to be a ceramic teacher or a teacher of art, I gleaned from 
the sort of spirit of Ken Ferguson, the, the life and times of Val Cushing, the incredibly, overly humble experience of my high school teacher, Paul Bernhardt, who couldn't let any compliment land on him at all. He just, he denied any responsibility for having any skills or engendering anything to us, and that, like, a, it, it, he had the best laugh in the world, which doesn't have to do with teaching, but kind of it does. Like, he, he took everything was about a joyous, a joyous love of making, and I wanted to impart that. And I want to be the best of all these people that are my heroes in what I become. Uh, and then met, married with that is just a, a culture that comes from my own family, which is one thing a lot of teachers, all my aunts and uncles on my father's side have uh, terminal degrees and value education. And I think it's just part of my makeup that I'm part of that thing. It's almost like an expectation. You will represent yourself this way. You will comport yourself and honor what our family represents. So it was not a choice. It was one of those membership community memberships that you were involuntarily a part of. Um, the behaviors of my subculture that I'm a member of, a community member of, of graffiti has very, very rigid standards. And I, I talk about that a lot too in the sense that graffiti artists, the motivation to be a graffiti artist, to be a good graffiti artist, don't come from, they come from outside of institution. They come from outside of an economic payoff because these people are doing it at duress of being uh, incarcerated. Uh, most of the time they steal the materials that are used to make the work because you're not going to go out and spend $150 on spray paint to do something you're going to be thrown in jail for. So you are stealing paint. Um, but what's motivating them to work diligently, arduously on an outline, a complicated outline for a piece that they are competing with a neighborhood uh, another uh, uh, individual in the neighborhood who does graffiti, and there's this sort of silent visual battle going on all the time, where the development and improvisation and uh, scaffolding of this graffiti artist competing with this guy, and then he gets the challenge, and he goes here with, and then this guy goes here with, and here goes, da, 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 da. and that image I showed with those three pieces of contemporary graffiti on it is the result of this 40 years of hyper compressive competitive visual competition that doesn't have any outcome other than this wonderful moment at the end. So you see the train come down the yard the next day. You've been out there all night, 2 a.m., doing a piece, and the only payoff is seeing it come out into the daylight. This is it. This is it. This is it. The train's coming down the line. That's it. That is the value of it, right? And if you can get that energy or that necessity into the classroom a little bit, it's cool, but they, this subculture governs itself and is cr critical of each other but on the same things that we care about. Line quality, color relationships, raw skill, hand skills, practice. Are you good? Are you inventive? Are you, are you doing something different than anybody else? I mean, these are all things we want to evolve out of our own academic study of art. And so I try to show that it's not about being in the system that makes it why you do this. It's something much deeper, much more in us to improve. So I don't know, those are models for teaching. There's a kind of mentorship that's entrusted in the graffiti community. You, you're, it's implied that you're gonna help the next young person up and so on. So that's, that's a culture that comes from the crafts too, the mentorship structure. I think there was one more question, no? Or did it get answered? Oh, here. Thank you. So, I wonder how strongly do you defend appropriation of art across the community identities? Hmm. Um, with somebody who maybe outside the identity of African American pulls a little puppy into their artwork, or outside the community of graffiti artists pulls that into their artwork as well. Like, how much space and allowance is there for artists to do that? I think that's our role, is to assimilate that way. But, even in, in redeploying something, it's gaining a different and new meaning. It doesn't have the original meaning encoded in it anymore. So we can't get all uptight because someone else wants to use that thing. Um, I mean, there are times when it seems a little icky, but I mean, there was a recent, uh, the, uh, the, the painter that did the piece about Emmett Till. 
Dana shoots. I don't have a problem with it, in the slightest. Um, I think it's a per- the subject matter, subject matter. And if we're going to get over this gulf between this stuff and your stuff, she's got to be able to make a painting about Emmett Till. I don't have a problem. Does that answer the question? Thank you. All right. I think we've done it. Thank you, everybody.